All right, everybody. This is Ross the Fig Boss. We got another fig interview today, and I have a very special guest, a good friend of mine, Romeo. Romeo is located in uh, Allentown, right outside of Allentown, Pennsylvania. And he comes from a family uh, with Syrian origin. And Romeo's been growing figs for a long time. I don't know if he's been as uh, active on the fig communities for as long as some other people have, but he has been definitely in this endeavor for quite a while. And uh, he's going to share today his story. We're going to talk actually a little bit about, uh, you know, also the Belclare guys at Belclare Nursery, um, which is a bit interesting. We're going to talk also about the flavors of figs. And we're going to get into some specifics about growing figs in Allentown and the, in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, as well as, again, you know, similar, similar to, to my area as well. And it should be very informative. And, uh, you know, Romeo has a very... Um, awesome personality. So I think we'll have a lot of good uh, back and forth in this one. So Romeo, please, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Tell us uh, who you are, you know, how you got into all this and uh, why you love figs. Hello, everybody. My name is Romeo Asaf. I'm here with Ross, the fig boss, <laughs> the <clears throat> new champion of figs. Um, but seriously, uh, I started with figs ever since I was little. When I was a little boy, my grandfather, who emigrated to this country in 1970, his dream was to purchase a house and bring the rest of his family over, which were my aunts and uncles, including my mother. And he realized that dream, came to this country, purchased a house, worked hard with my grandmother, and little by little, they brought over the rest of the family. And during that period of time, he was fortunate enough to have a little piece of land in the back, and he was able to grow fruits and vegetables, and one of the delicious fruits happened to be figs. So at an early age, I was able to help tend the garden. I would go down there every summer, pick fresh fruits, fresh uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, lettuce. I mean, you name it. The, the gam you know, runs the gamut of all different vegetables because he actually came from a farming community. In Syria, we come from an area where it's all mountains and valleys. And the main crop is actually olives. On both sides of my family, on my father's side and my mother's side, we have lots of land and we grow olives and press olive oil. And that's wow. something that actually I do miss is just that fresh taste of olive oil from the old country. But anyway, so I, at an early age, I was around growing fruits and vegetables and, and especially fig trees. And so it's something that, that tapped into something inside that just feels so natural, feels so right that I think is lost in modern society. I think there's a, a piece that comes about when you're in touch with the land, when you actually dig your hands in the soil. And I think there have been some studies done that the actual bacteria that's released can stimulate the body, stimulate the mind, as well as I think there's a spiritual aspect of it that if you get into it and you, you have the feeling like planting a seed or planting a tree or a branch and then watch it grow, you tend to it, you feed it, you water it, and then now it gives something back to you. It gives you a fig or a peach or, a, you know, whatever it may be, a tomato. I think there's just something natural about that that gives a certain sense of peace mm -hmm. that unfortunately I think has been lost in modern society that I would recommend go out there. Don't be afraid. Make mistakes. That's the best way you could learn is to just try and try and try until you, you know, you have that success. So anyway, getting back to... My story, mm -hmm. my grandfather, all that time with my grandfather fostered a, a special desire to grow fruits and vegetables and really be in touch with the land. When I, in 2003, I had moved to Long Island, to Huntington, Long Island, and I was fortunate enough to have a little plot of land. And that's when I decided I want to grow something besides tomatoes and cucumbers. And that's when I thought about figs. Like I haven't had a great fig in a long, long time. And fortunately for me, five, 10 minutes from where I lived in Huntington was Belclair Nursery. And so as I was searching on the internet for nurseries, okay, where do I find fig trees? I didn't know anything about the fig forums uh, or anything like that. I, I didn't really explore the internet at that time, but I made my way over to Belclair Nursery and I met the guys and it was an amazing experience just to see their passion, you know, that old school passion that they brought with them from the Italian side, the Italian heritage. And you know, I learned a lot from those guys. They, they, they sparked that passion and just fed me more and more and more. And I mean, at the time, it was, it was in its infancy, not like now where you can go on a fig bid 
and click on something. You could see the whole history of the fig and you could bid on any type and find new varieties from California or new varieties from Portugal or from Spain or from anywhere around the world. And it's just, it was at its infancy. So it was, there was something simple and, and yet peaceful about it. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't that money aspect of it. And come on, let's get the next big variety and let's put it out there and make some money. And it was just really more pure, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I learned from those guys, really just the passion that they reignited in me. Yeah, you know, Romeo, um, I didn't tell you before we started, but um, when you, I heard you tell me about your grandfather, and then you told me, actually, before we started recording everybody, Romeo did mention that the Belclair guys rem reminded him of his grandfather and how he got into figs from his grandfather, essentially. Um, and the same thing was with my situation. You know, my grandfather... Um, uh, you know, showed me as a, at a young age, he didn't have a fig tree, uh, because he moved to Florida. And so mm -hmm. when I was born, uh, he lived in Florida, but I got to see him a lot. Yep. And so his fig tree was in New Jersey and, you know, we didn't have access to it. And, but I did get to eat because of him. And he showed me a lot of things in life, not just figs, but you know, he taught me how to cook. He taught me, um, you know, he, he showed me the love of tennis. He made me more business minded. He made me a very hard worker. Uh, he made me a lot of things, um, that affect my personality. He's really one of my biggest idols. And he was over in my house, um, in August. And so he came by and saw all the backyard every year. He comes by at some point and Romeo was there this year. And it was just to another level of craziness. And I said to him, as soon as he came out there, I said, you see all this? This is because of you. You did this. <laughs> and he just couldn't help but chuckle. Um, and I was showing him around the figs, and he got to taste some of the earlier varieties. And uh, he actually got to eat some Dotato. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should said this in some other video I did, but he was like, he was like, uh, Ross, you gotta you gotta sell this fig for more money than all the others. <laughs> I said, why? <laughs> He's like, well, it's the best one. It's you, it's your best one. I was like, Dotato. Um, so it's just amazing. I think where you know uh, he gets his preferences, but uh, I did want to say that actually, Romeo. I know um, your grandfather got you into this. And my grandfather got me into this. And just as kind of a, an ode to him, um, who very recently actually has passed away. Um, and in fact, tomorrow I'm going to get to see him for the first time. Um, he's actually been dead for 10 days and he died in Austria oh, and, uh, they were on a cruise. And so it took a while for his body to come here. And so I'm going to get to see him and say goodbye to him. And then Wednesday is, uh, is the funeral, but, um, you know, it's just amazing what somebody can have an effect on you and, and what you do in your life. Um, my condolences, Russ. Yeah. Thanks man. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I think it's, it's nice that they did this for us and we are now the people doing this for other people. You know, we're now sharing the love of figs for everybody else. Um, if I could just say, how fortunate are we, Ross, that we had that influence in our lives? I mean, everybody, whether it's your grandfather, grandmother, neighbor, father, mother, whatever, you know, or even just a guy at the nursery. But mm -hmm. when you find someone that sparks that passion inside of you, it's just amazing. I think it's a great gift. But in my heart, my grandmother and grandfather always held special places because of that special nature that they can have, that relationship that they can have. They're not raising the child. They don't have to discipline you, but they really give you love and they give you so many other good things that the mother and father really can't give you. So it's, I think it's just a really special relationship. And so mm -hmm. I think we're very fortunate that we've had that. So Romeo, we, um, I don't want to dwell on this too much because uh, it. it may lower the mood a little bit, got but it, um, let's move on to some things I, I really wanted to touch on in this episode. Um, I know as you know, my personal opinion is that there's very small handful of fig growers that I really value their opinions when it comes to the flavor of figs. Um, obviously everybody has their own opinion and a lot of it is going to be good. Um, 
more is good. But people like you know yourself, uh, my friend Raphael, um, Eric Durchy, um I'm missing one other person that I was thinking of just now. Uh, they know who they are. But the point is, is that you certainly have a better palate than I would I would say most people, or at the very minimum, you and I could describe what we're eating better than most people. Yeah, I and think so, you have the nail on the head. Right. So it's it's not necessarily we have some special talent or something. It's just something we've cultivated, we've worked on, mm -hmm. and we value what we eat. It's really that simple, and we dissect what we eat. And so you coming over to my place this summer, um, doing a fig tasting with you, you brought some figs. I had a lot of figs, some that were stored actually for that purpose and dried them in the fridge. Um, but it was nice to have your perspective as well as mine to teach some of the other people that were there with us what a fig is really about and all the different complexities and all that. And I think those people that were brand new to it walked away feeling really good about figs as a whole. Um, so let's share some things with, um, with everybody. Uh, I, as you know, probably, and some other people have done this, we've, I've created a flavor profile sheet. And so where do you exactly put the flavors of figs? Do you think that there's all these different types? Do you just kind of narrow it down? Um, where, what, if you could describe to people, I know this is a lot of questions, Romeo, but uh, if you could describe <laughs> the, uh, what a fig tastes like, you know, um, what are some of the things that you're picking up? Because it's not just about one fig tastes the same as the all the others. Every variety is different. The genetics yes. tell us really what the fig is going to taste like. Yes. Um, and so what are some of the things, the experiences that you've picked up? Because you're not just growing one fig, you're growing many. Yes, actually, I've, I've up until last winter, before last season, I had uh, 200 varieties. But last Whoa. winter, really, I took a hurt. I took a big beating anyway. <laughs> but the thing is, with, with figs, I think, Yes, I mean, typically what you find online, they generalize, you know, there's the berry, there's the caramel, there's the honey, there's, you know, the, the, the four or five different categories. That's fine if you want to generalize, mm -hmm. because obviously if you want to talk specifics, you know, there's just too much information, too many flavor profiles. I think if we take one level down from the general labels, okay, let's just start with, let's say, berry. Mm-hmm. I think with berry, because there's so many varieties, whether you're talking Mount Etna's or you're talking like Black Madeira's or the Borgeson Noir's or, I mean, I think if you dig deeply and if you taste enough figs, that's really, I think the key is that you need to taste enough figs to learn what are you tasting, okay? Borgeson Noir tastes good one year, the next year, maybe because of the weather, climate, watering, lack of fertilization or too much fertilization, whatever all the different variables, that taste will change. One year, it could be amazing. I had, I re remember two winter, uh, two summers ago, Villa de Bordeaux was amazing. My Nero 600, the flavor was just eh. I mean, it was like just, uh, just slightly above mediocre. The next season, my Villa de Bordeaux, it flip-flopped. The Nero 600 tasted better than just about any of the Mount Etnas. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the reasoning? For me right. personally, Whenever I come across these things, and just in general, not just with growing, I like to run little experiments in my head. <clears throat> they're not scientific experiments. They're more anecdotal. I'm, I don't have the time to do scientific experiments. But anecdotally, I try to keep track, make mental notes of what did I do differently? What has the weather been like? Has it been too warm? Has it been sunny? Has it been cloudy? Uh, did I give too much water, too little water? Years ago, years prior, I was hand-watering. And, you know, 200 pots of figs, especially mostly 20 gallons and 15 gallons and 13 gallons and 10 gallons, it would take me two hours every single day. And then about two years ago, two seasons ago, I decided to just upgrade everything. And I built a whole drip irrigation system, which I encourage you, if you are going to get into figs, or if you are at that level now where you're above 20, 30, 40, 50, look into it. There is a cost involved, but... You know, a lot of it is simple enough that you could do it at home. You watch a couple of videos online. You can at least get into it. It will save you time. I was able to save two and a half hours of time. And at that point, I was actually starting to dislike this 
quote unquote hobby because now it became work. Right. But anyway, so getting back to the flavors, I think there are varieties that there are subtle differences. If you taste enough figs, if you taste enough variety of figs, not mm -hmm. just the, you know, the, the black mission from the supermarket or the, you know, the, the panache that comes from uh, Trader Joe's, you know, from California, even though it's caprified. I mean, really just taste enough figs. I think that helps your palate or helps you to learn like, hmm, what is that flavor that I just picked up in there? Like, for instance, for a lot of people out there, Black Madeira was the it fig to have three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, even two years ago. Now, I still think that is probably one of the top two, top three figs. People ask why, what does it taste like? Black Madeira, first taste is obviously berry. It's a berry flavor. Now, sometimes it may be strawberry, sometimes cherry. I don't know, and I haven't done enough experimentation to find out, is that the terroir of the soil? Is that something with watering? Is that something due to the sun? I don't know if that's something genetic or environmental. That obviously would take, you know, I'd have to study one fig for the next 10, 15 years to answer that question. So I encourage you to go out there and experiment, pick a variety and experiment and taste more figs if you can, you know, have gatherings. Find somebody like, like Ross that's knowledgeable in your area or just find other people that, that love to grow figs. And you know what? Have a little gathering. Trade figs. Everybody bring some figs and taste them. I guarantee you that will help you to develop your palate and to understand, number one, what you like. And number two, what flavors are different, the nuances of flavors. So getting back to the Black Madeira, I pick up berry. And what kind of berry? It might be generic or it might be just a mixture of a few. There's a second note, like a figgy kind of taste. Sometimes there's even like, like hints of caramel, hints of honey, but there's another depth of flavor. And this is the one thing with Black Madeira, I have not been able to figure out what that, that third and fourth depth of flavor that just adds to it. Whereas if you taste, let's say, a Black Mission, I mean, it's plain, or if, you know what, let's even simplify things because most people have Italian honey or have a taste of Italian honey. Italian honey, I mean, it's, it's tasty, but it's just sweet. I mean, it's really just one note. It's a one note fig. I'm not saying that's bad. Somebody might come across and love that fig, but just know that it's a single note fig. You know, so there's other flavors, other things out there. If you're feeling bold, try it, experiment. And when I say experiment, it doesn't mean I, you have to go out and buy the most expensive fig or the hottest name fig that just came out and everybody wants it. I'm finding in recent years, and this is something that I actually had in mind because I'll, I'll be honest, I got caught up in that, ooh, I got to have the latest fig, the, you know, the, more, the rarest fig. And to be honest with you, half of them shouldn't even grow in my climate. Mm -hmm. I don't have a greenhouse. I don't have long enough sun, sunshine and, and heat for it. So why am I growing it? I, I, I think it's it. actually more than half, but yeah, I get your point. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to be generous. Yeah. But basically, if you find a, find a great fig for your area, something for your climate. If you don't know what that is, there's a lot of information. Ross has done something that I haven't seen from most other people in the fig community. He's basically taken a lot of information. He runs his own experiments and he collates it and puts it on his website. And it's, it's great information. And honestly, Ross, I want to actually thank you oh. for me. And on behalf of the rest of the community, you do a valuable service. Wow. And honestly, I think a lot of people appreciate that. Oh, thanks, man. Because you're bringing, you're bringing that information to the masses. You're helping yeah. to educate. You don't have all the answers, and you never have said you do. Yes. But you run your little experiments. You try new things. You find out whatever doesn't work or whatever. You know, you, you, you're basically constantly changing. Every season, you're changing. And I appreciate that about you. Mm -hmm. I, I do appreciate That's that. That's the fun part I about it, Romeo. Thank you so yes. much, man. That Honestly, that is part of my personality to do something a little yes. different. I don't like being a robot yes. and just doing the same thing every single time. Figs, growing plants, they can be very creative. And so I just find that uh, trying something new is not, I'm not um, afraid of it. I'm not afraid of new. I'm not afraid of change. And so when you do something new and you, you try something different, even if it's just totally doesn't make any sense. Um, obviously, it should make probably some sense, but doing something backwards usually allows you to understand things in a better way than you did before. So, mm -hmm. but I would say actually Italian honey does have a little bit of one note, a little more than one note, maybe a note and a half or 
or uh, two notes, but I get your point. Um, there is, I think, a richness to Black Madeira, and so um, you didn't talk a lot about the texture, but a fig like Black Madeira, if properly ripens, and it's hard to get that prop that fig really properly ripened here. I mean, we don't have the climate for it. Yeah, I mean, a Black Madeira that's perfect is a totally different fig than just sort of semi-ripe or, or you know, really just barely ripe. Um, and so the texture can really change. I've had some from all over the country, actually. I've had one that was grown in California and caprified. Uh, you know, I've had some from different people's yards. Uh, I've had, obviously, some from my own. And it's an incredible fig. By the way, you know, if I think about, like you said, the top three figs, it's in the top three, at least. I would say Black Madeira is the king, right? Let's just say it's the king. I would say the Col de Doms are the queen, right? And a lot of people, I think, probably consider that them the queen, um, just because they sort of is. I think Col de Dom translates to a lady's neck, and so there's a the queen properties there. But um, that one has an incredible texture. And so that is a totally overlooked thing. We'll get into that, but... Um, even, I don't know what your third is, what you would put uh, as well in the, in that top three, but I think a fig called Hivernenka is probably in there as well. And that's again, a really difficult one to, to properly ripen. And so I would probably put that one in there as maybe let's call it the Jack or something. Um, and there's probably other figs, you know, that are, are right up there as well. It's hard to, um, say f for sure in terms of, um, you know, because there's a lot of similarities between there's a lot of Col de Dom type figs, figs similar to the Col de Dom. There's a lot of figs similar to Black Madeira, like Borgia Sot Noir is rather similar to Black Madeira. Uh, and then you've got, uh, if you were generalizing here, but then I think the the Hivernenka figs, and there's quite a few of them, uh, I think deserve some sort of mantle. And uh, I even said... Many years ago, when I tried my first De La Senora Hivernenka, that I said, oh, this is going to be, I called it the Black Madeira Killer, because I thought mm -hmm. at some point it was going to it was gonna replace Black Madeira. Now, I still believe that, but I killed my tree. <laughs> so I haven't been able to really back that up, but um, I do think it's that- It's funny you say that, because after you said that, my tree died too. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got get... what you wrote, and I was looking forward to it, and it died that winter. Oh man, uh, yeah, we, we gotta I never get had some... a chance to replace it. We got to replace it because it's got this really short hang time, and that was the best part about it. Um, because I Black agree. Madeira is late, so is Hibernenka. Yes. They're late, but if even in this fall weather, I've talked to a number of other growers in these interviews. Big Bill, uh, Steve Northware, he was telling me the same thing that we all agree that these Adriatic figs, they're doing really well in this cooler weather. They just outperform a lot of them. And a lot of that, I think, I is just they don't really need to be super ripe to taste great. You know, yes. a Black Madeira does need to be somewhat ripe to taste good. Um, Bill was saying that actually Italian 258 is kind of in the same category as Adriatics and that they it can get away with maybe not being as, as tasty. But this whole other thing about having the short hang time and that short susceptibility window, like De La Senora Hivernenka is, it'll produce a more reliably tasty fig even in the fall, even when it ripens so late. Um, so anyway, that's those are my thoughts on that. What do you well, think? Well, I agree with you. I agree with you because uh, as far as especially I want to touch on what you just mentioned about short hang time. I think yeah. for people, especially in the northern climates or if – Pests are an issue like fungus gnats or even uh, yellow jackets or, you know, anything like that. Shorter hang time means you have a better shot of eating a good fig than, let's yep. say, or even just birds. This year, birds and squirrels have discovered my, my orchard, ah. and they've basically eaten three-quarters of what I have. I, I, so much so that next year, I think I'm going to have to invest, like, a, a net system completely over. And I'm talking for, like, a 50 by 50 area. So Man. it's not going to be cheap, but I have to decide. I want to eat figs. I mean, I like birds, but I, I work too hard on the figs to feed the birds. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I fortunately have cats in the neighborhood, and I also have – I just invested in a squirrel trap. And I 
that trap does a lot for getting rid of the, uh, or you can even move them. If you get good at them, you can kill them, you can move them, whatever you want to choose to do. But those squirrels, when they find your figs, forget about it. you got to do oh. something about it because th- a net Listen. isn't going to do it. <laughs> Listen, you don't have to tell me. I have a big oak tree, which gives them enough acorns. I have a huge mulberry tree. Yeah. And between that, when, when, when those aren't ripe or those are not ready, this season, actually springtime, the squirrels have discovered my fuyu persimmon. Oh. And they literally ate all of the little green nuts to them. I, I suppose they were green nuts. They would take a couple of bites, and I find them all over the, the ground. And actually, just today, I harvested two i was left with two that they missed all right well if you come here i can give you some dude i got i found a patch of american persimmon uh wild off the highway i harvested 700 so if you if you ever if you come by here i'll give you a lot i'll give you as many as you need sounds good sounds good but yeah i feel i feel for everybody who's got these problems because we all inevitably do we all run into the the squirrel and the and the bird problems um it's i would say it's yeah, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, not to interrupt, but I always say the job of a farmer is so difficult and you really don't know until you start growing just as a hobby for yourself, whether it's fruits and vegetables, you just don't really know. And I have so much respect for farmers. It's so the, for you farmers out there, you guys are the heroes. It's depressing too, isn't it? If you lose yeah. all your Fuyu persimmons, that's the saddest mo- that would be the saddest moment of my life. I waited eight <laughs> years to get a good crop of Rosianca persimmons. <laughs> and if the squirrels took all of them, yeah. I don't know what I would do, dude. I would lose my yeah. mind. Um, yeah. You know, it's like keying your car or something, and your car is your baby. Uh, but to for me, I think it's even worse. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Um, well, I, I agree. I think it's worse because, really, we have to wait a whole season. It's one more year. Yep. To mm-hmm. taste that fruit, to taste the fruits of your labor, and in the case of let's get back to figs. Mm-hmm. So you 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 know you found a forum online. Somebody mentioned figs. You see a little stick on a website. You pay money for it. You, that stick comes home. You read all about how are you going to grow this stick. You finally see some roots and you see some leaves pushing out, and you're so excited you can barely taste that fig in your mouth, and yet you're still like a year, year and a half, two years away. So now you're at that two-year mark. You have a, a tree, a young tree. You have a couple of figs on there, and along comes a little squirrel or a bird and just eats that little. I, I mean, you know, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. You have to wait a whole another year. So Romeo, let's get back to the berry figs because we we got sidetracked yes. a lot. But yes, we did. No worries. Sorry um, I got a couple. I got one question for you quickly. Do you agree or disagree? Yes or no? The best tasting fig is the one that's the most consistently ripe or the most ripe on that given day. I'd say yes at first glance, Mm -hmm. but no also because if you add the component, and you mentioned this earlier about your grandfather and the dotato. Yeah. Every person has a different palate. Yeah. You know, what might taste great to me might be just meh to you or someone else. So... If it's the perfect conditions, perfect ripeness, I may love it. You may think it's just, okay, it's a seven. It's not a 10. So I think that has a certain amount of play that, that comes into consideration. But to answer your question, yes, I think the perfect ripeness is the maximum flavor that you're going to achieve from that fig based on that environment. Well, thank you. I'm glad someone agrees. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of people pick their figs too soon. And so... Yes. They, we also get carried away, like we talked about with the varieties, um, and usually the one that just performs the best to produce the one that is the most consistently, the most ripe, is going to be the best one. And so that's why I've dramatically shifted my thinking. That's what we ta- That's why we talked about the hang time. Um, but so going back to the berry figs now, we mentioned Black Madeira. We mentioned the Colda Doms, uh, Hibernenka, but, you know, tell us more about these berry flavors and things. Because you, you, when you came to my place, I mean, you you tasted some pretty uh, interesting berry flavors in some of these, and they weren't even caprified. So, yes, yes. Which, is, if you could imagine, if we lived in the land of caprification, California, and how fortunate you are if you live in that land to grow figs, um, there's a wide plethora of flavors, you know, so there's subtle nuances this way or that way. But let's just say, for argument's sake, it's a berry fig. So there's the Mount Etna's, and there's varying degrees of flavor 
Is that once again due to environment or is that due to the variety that has yet to be determined? Um, I encourage you to run your own experiments and find a variety that, that you like or you, you seem attached to and keep growing it continually and grow some others. Uh, but as far as the different flavors, I mean, there are different nuances of flavors. Texture is an is amazing conversation. We have so many different varieties of textures, almost as much as flavor. So when you add that component, it really becomes even more complex. But for argument's sake, and just for this conversation, we'll, we'll stick with just the flavors. So the Cola Doms, I think, have great combination of flavor and texture. Um, you mentioned it, but you didn't really, I'm going to describe for people that haven't tasted the Cola Doms and why I encourage to at least grow one Cola Dom. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a colder area, choose the Cola Dom Gris because that's going to give you the, the, the shortest season to taste the ripe fig. But the inside, if you imagine just like you open up a, a jar of preserves or, or jam, yeah, and you take a spoon and you can scoop it out. You can literally do that with the cold adam, and you put it in your mouth. And if you pick it at that best, you know that ripeness. Yeah, not when it's in the beginning when it starts to droop. I mean, really, you have to let it hang, and you have to just be patient. And that's I, I think something that comes with with more trees and more years of experience. You'll you'll learn that. But anyway, so you have that texture of this thick jam. Not many seeds. That's one nice thing about the cold adams. If you don't like seeds, which I know, Ross, you don't you don't care for seeds. I, I like um, seeds. It's just that it, <laughs> the seeds, believe it or not, determine the texture. So if yes. there's a lot of seeds, that means there's a lot of acnes. And so the acnes yes. are that female flower parts. There's mm -hmm. many of them, 100, 500 different individual acnes within a fig. And so the cold adams have very few, and typically they're very small. And so that's to me, actually, why the texture is so amazing in those figs. And also, you can, it is like a scoop of jam, but the type of jam is like a really thick jam. It's almost like a pancake batter. Um, yes. But continue. Yeah, so so you, you take that scoop and then you put it in your mouth and you taste some kind of berry. So if you tried all kinds of different berries, it's not like I could tell you it's strawberry or it's exactly raspberry or. I mean, you, you kind of have to think of it more like a fruit punch, mm. you know, where let's say in the fruit punch, there's a little bit more raspberry or there's, this one has a little bit more strawberry. Right. So when we say berry flavor, that's really what you're what we're talking about. Yeah. And so there, it's kind of like a fruit punch. And there's so many berries. I mean, I don't know yes. how many how many you grow, yes. Romeo, but I have tasted at least especially in like June. I, I mean, I eat probably like 10 to 15 different berries at, at any given moment. Um, there's so many different types of berries and there's such a huge range of what these berries taste like. Mm -hmm. The beauty of a fig is that they, they represent a lot of these other fruits in only one fruit. It's amazing. Yes. Uh, it is know, amazing. the honeyberry is one of my favorite fruits. It's become one of my favorites. And when you really learn how to pick them, they have uh, maybe three to four, maybe five different fruits within them, uh, different berries. Um, but for the most part, they're really only like you could say you could boil it down to a kiwi and a grape. Some of them are a little strawberry-like, but blueberry-like, um, maybe even blackberry-like. But the fig is just such a it's such a wide representative of some of these flavors. So yes. And that's why actually I like growing different varieties of figs. And I think it, it helps to bring in more people into the, you know, to the fig world is that once they do try those figs and they start to pick up on those different flavors, uh, just to get away from berry real quick. Like for instance, when you're talking about the, uh, the golden rainbows and the golden river sides, you know, those golden figs that are yellow on the outside, on the inside, generally you could have like banana, sometimes mango, sometimes hint of papaya, or maybe some other tropical fruits. Mm -hmm. you know, they, certain families tend to have similar flavors, obviously, like the Adriatics, or if we're talking about the Mount Etnas, for instance. Um, getting back to a different type of berry, like for instance, one comes to mind, Red Lebanese from the Beka Valley. That one, a lot of people, including myself, can pick up the cherry in it. Mm -hmm. And there's a, and I, and when I pick it when it's perfectly ripe, yeah. It's a berry. Imagine a berry fruit punch, but that flavor of a cherry is basically the last note that I taste in my mouth. Right. And it's a strong note, and it's a nice note to finish on, to be honest with you. So I, I think, you know, there's there's other types that I, I can't think of any that come to mind, but, you know, that one has that, that strong cherry taste. 
that you know my friend about. Romeo his name is uh Steven and so Steven um he's on the growing figs forum or the growing fruit forum excuse me and so Steven is growing all kinds of fruit but he's gotten into figs and him and I have become some you know kind of pals and he was telling me recently that he loves the richness in a fig um <sighs> Now, obviously, there's a lot of berry figs, but and there's a lot of honey figs, and there's a lot of different flavors. But one of the things I think gets overlooked, especially the, is the texture, but also is the lingering feeling on your palate. And that's a big component of texture. That's a big component of mouthfeel, body, whatever you want to call it. Uh, think about just wine how people go crazy for that lingering oak or that lingering yes. astringent tannin feel. Uh, you know, what are some of the figs that you think really have that lingering profile? Well, I want to add to what you're saying, and it's really not just the pulp on the inside. It's also the skin. So, mm. I mean, I know in many parts of the Mediterranean, including where my family's come from, they typically peel the skin off. But yeah. If you are more bold and you don't do that, I would encourage you to taste the skin. Now, let me clarify. It has to be really ripe because if you pick it when it's really early, and let's say when you look at pictures online and it's sliced open in half, when you look at the outside border, if it's a bright white, that means that fig really needed more time to hang. So yes. it didn't develop the sugars. You're not getting the maximum flavor, but also the skin, you're, you're really tasting that latex, that milky latex, was, to be honest with you, it's not really a pleasant taste, but if you give it time to hang and maybe shrivel a little bit, that skin will be very thin. And man, that skin just adds so much depth of flavor. I'm finding the darker figs, like the purple, the dark purples and the bluish hues, they have such great flavor to the skin. Yeah. And so that adds like another note on top of the pulp on the inside, whether it's berry or, or you know, any, anything else. Um, I'm trying to think of a fig that that lingers. It's, yeah, it's, I, I can't think of the name of it. Actually, it's well, one of my wife's favorites. Well, I'll tell you and this. Oh, you if you you want to you want to go because I I can. Uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. I, I I'll try to think of it. Well, I'll say this before we go on to the other thing is that LSU Tiger has an incredible skin to it. And I don't know if how many of those you've grown or uh, how much time you've I, given I, it. Mine died, but <laughs> I've tasted yours at our tasting, and you oh, know something. Right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. The, the skin does have a nice taste to it. It's actually one of the most pleasant skin tastes I've tasted. It's it by far, I, I think it is by far the best skin I've had on a fig. Um, and, and it's it actually it paired really nicely with the pulp. Yeah, it's a different it, texture. It's just really nice. It's not a sing, it's not a singular entity as some figs are, which I don't. I like that actually. I don't. I don't like the two different textures because sometimes the skin texture is actually not that great. Um, mm -hmm. but if you can get a very different texture and equally the textures of the pulp and the skin are just as pleasing, that's a huge bonus. And LSU tiger yes. does that, which is why I've been saying this whole year, I've been trying to get people awake to realize just how good it is. Cause it never really got any credit. Dan Foster was the first one really to, to say this. Um, so you got to give him the credit, but we have to now let people aware that this is like an incredible fig. I don't know wh who was it at the tasting, but somebody actually selected LSU Tiger as their favorite that day. Um, and it really is one of the, and it's just like, it is like an improved Celeste. It's amazing that yes. it, a Celeste yes. could be as good as that in terms of flavor. I, I'm very curious to see how black Celeste kind of compares to that one. Um, Cause I haven't had, I didn't get to taste one this year. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably right up there, but a very different experience altogether um, than Blacks, than um, LSU Tiger. But anyway, um, in terms of lingering flavors, figs that really linger on my palate, I remember when I first started doing fig tastings and doing them with a video, uh, I had Smith on a number of my videos, and I would try Smith, and then I would taste the next fig, and I'd be like, wait a second, that tastes just like Smith because it was still on my palate. Smith yes. is a, is just amazing. Um, I also find that Azores Dark really lingers on my palate. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a richness to some of these figs, and I think that's pretty, it's really what people I think are describing when they want this richer flavor, uh, like my friend Stephen had mentioned. And so, there there's probably I would say a, a large amount of them. I don't think it's that uncommon, especially among the definitely the better tasting figs. Um, but certainly, I think you could find it to add what do, what you're saying. I yeah. think you could find them. In certain families, I've noticed in the Adriatics, oh, yeah. the skin is just thick, not impressive, really, you could eat it or not. It's not going to really add much flavor. I think it takes away. I think we have to look more towards the darker figs, mm-hmm. the darker colored outside figs. Those tend to have better tasting skin or even just some of the other honey figs or the caramel family figs. They also have their, their skin, I think, when picked at peak ripeness, adds a certain component, like another level, another depth of flavor. So I think you could generalize across the board with, with several flavors of figs, several families. I don't remember. I think it was uh, Fruit Nut in Texas. He was mm-hmm. saying that I think it was Strawberry Verte or Emerald mm-hmm. Strawberry. I think it was Strawberry Verte. Uh, he said that if you don't eat the skin, you're missing the best part of the fig. It was a Strawberry ver- Verte, yeah. So that's interesting. I haven't... Uh, Noticed actually, I've, I'm in agreement with you on a lot of my Adriatics. Haven't noticed much of a pleasantness in the skin, but my strawberry verte is very small, and I killed mine years ago. So we'll see. Um, in any case, yeah, uh, it's it's interesting. All of this is, is berry figs your your favorite type of fig? Yes, I, I tend to gravitate towards the berry figs. I mean, I can enjoy the other ones. Mm-hmm. Um, I've branched out. There are some varieties. One I actually brought to the party was the Naples Dark. Yeah. Uh, introduced by Joe Marzak. Uh, I hope I said Shout out to right Joe. Correctly, Joe. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Joe. That was a local variety found in Southeast PA, and it was purported to come from Naples. So yes. they named it Naples Dark. Mm-hmm. And that one is actually a large size fig. It has notes of caramel. I mean, like, really just several notes of caramel when at peak ripeness now. It's a large fig. There is some sweetness to it. There's a figgy taste to it. I would say there's at least a good two, three, maybe four notes. Plus the skin is actually pleasant too when it's at peak ripeness. Now remember for this conversation, folks, if you're listening, peak ripeness, not in the beginning. I know when it starts to droop a little bit, hang, let it hang on, you know, cover it, get some organza bags. I use that. That helps actually with the birds, figure out some way, protect that fig and give it some hang time, I promise you, you'll be rewarded. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, dude. Uh, What about some of the other unique profiles? You know, I think Naples Dark is actually pretty impressive. Um, What about some other unique tasting figs? We talked a lot about berries, but... Yeah, well, let's go to the other family. And this is one that I I see continually, even now, still commands some high prices, like the Golden Rainbow. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and even Golden Riverside. And, and really, the other figs that are green on the outside, but when they ripen, they become yellow. Mm. And many people describe it as tropical flavors. My palate typically picks up. And I mean, I would say there are similarities across the board. Yeah. In a good year, Golden Rainbow, I've picked up hints of mango, papaya, yep. um, you know, some other kind of tr- just basically like make a tropical fruit salad with banana as the main component. Mm. And that's what you get out of that that family of figs. Right. I have a Golden Riverside, which actually came from, you know, UC Davies. And it's delicious. I mean, when I pick it at peak ripeness, almost every year, some years it's a little bit off, but let's say a great year, the flavor is just wow. Mm. You know, I have another variety, one I brought to the party, and actually I got this from Big Bill. Yeah. Um, it's labeled as Holier, and that's how Bill received it as Holier. Yeah, that was but good. that's the one that has a different color than you have. Yep. That one for that type of fig, it's amazing. There's another, there's an extra note in there mm-hmm. that I would say it's one of my favorites for the lighter colored figs. Now, is it Holier? I don't know. Whatever it is, it's a delicious <laughs> fig. <laughs> yeah. And I almost lost it too. I'm, I'm glad it came back. Oh, okay. Any others that people should know about um, that are quite unique? Because I, I found some... Yeah. No. You... Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of the name of the variety. I, honestly, it escapes me right now. Okay. If I if I take a quick lap outside, I can see the name of it. But no worries. Um, yeah, it's amazing yeah. when you see the fig, even the tree. You're like, oh, I know what that is. You don't even have to look at the label. But um, yeah, 
Some others that really impress me, the Naples Dark is is similar to like something like Little Ruby. It really has some of that dried fruit flavor, that figginess. Um, I think that's rather unique. I also really like Bar Malone. You didn't get to taste that one this year as it ripened no. in like early October for me. Uh, but that is supposed to be a white Marseille that has a mutation. And so it has dark skin. And the skin actually adds some things. It, it has a very interesting pulp. It's it's more than just your average honey fig, uh, like your your huye that you have. Um, it's rather interesting. And also the Godfather, which is uh, another of these sugar figs uh, that has an interesting profile. Um, it's definitely a match for Osborne Prolific, and I don't think people pay enough attention to that fig. Uh, I have Osborne Prolific. You do? Do you like it? Yeah. I, you know what? Uh, it, unfortunately, it because it's Breva, you know, it, it gives you certain limitations, so you're not getting a full crop. Oh. But the flavor, when it's perfectly ripe, yeah. wow, I could pick up three, four notes in there. And the skin does add something to it as well. When you, And I'm talking about, like, wrinkled, like, wrinkled, hanging down. Interesting. It's it's a great fig. Well, Romeo, I think we need to wrap it up just because we're getting that time, man. Yeah. Um, I really so, appreciate you stopping by, you doing this with everybody. Uh, all the information that you've been able to share today, I think people can really relate to it uh, and also use that uh, and apply that to their own adventure in growing figs. Um, so, Romeo, I know uh, you don't really have anything to plug, but if you have anything you want to close with, anything you want to say to everybody, uh, now's the time. Don't be afraid to go out there and experiment you know, I recommend if you're, especially if you're starting off, mm -hmm. don't chase after the big names, find some other people in your area, find the, the typical tried and true figs, quote unquote, whatever that means, but the figs that have been around that are less expensive. So you could learn on them. You won't, it won't cost too much. And this way, at least you could start to develop flavor profiles of what you like. Pick one from each category, several categories, pick a honey fig, pick an Adriatic, pick a, pick a Mount Etna, start with those. And grow them out for a few years. Yep. And then you can move up to the other flavors that maybe aren't the best for your area, but find what's best for your area. If you don't have a season for Black Madeira, it's not worth it for you to, to go through the effort of buying it and tending to it to only taste one fig a year. Yep. Whereas you could pick up a, a Mount Etna that you'll have 30, 40, 50 figs a year if you have a short season, for instance, or your climate is different. But Pick one that works for your area. That's my best recommendation. Yeah, and they're not bad, too. So you can at least – yeah, I, I mean, listen, if it's a great-tasting fig, then that's really the point of it. Right, exactly. So not the, not the name, not the big name. Yeah, so there it is, dude. I mean, that's the best advice I think anybody can yeah. give at this point, really. It is. Um, so, Romeo, thanks again, man. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Ross, for having me. Yeah, everybody else, thanks for watching this one. Check out our blog, figboss.com. Hit that subscribe button. We'll see you for uh, more fig interviews and other videos. Take care, guys.